The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew in the second chapter, the lectionary reading for Epiphany Sunday. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? We observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. Now when King Herod heard this, he was frightened. And when King Herod, well this is my annotator. And when King Herod is frightened, all Jerusalem is with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And the scribes told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and they and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. And then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. And when they had heard the king, the wise men set out and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. And then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their home by another way. Now the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the living word of God will stand forever. Amen. Will you please be seated? Now, I went to early church. So I already got my star. But I got the wrong star. This should have been one given to this congregation because my star's word says endurance. For you to endure my preaching for 30-something years. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I am not going to deconstruct this narrative. I'm going to let the narrative stand on its own. While some would want to argue about the idea of a star, I think the most perplexing thing to me in this biblical narrative is, why didn't the people in Jerusalem see the star? Now, Herod, who was called great, one would think that the king who renovated and expanded the temple, the icon of Judaism, would have been one to see the star if he was that religious. But he didn't even notice. And neither did the chief priests, 
And the Old Testament scholars see the star. I guess they were too busy finding little scriptural nuances to argue about, and they completely missed the star. And the general populace around Jerusalem, neither did they see a star or a comet or a planet or whatever you want to call it. Perhaps they were too busy making a living. The day-to-day -day grind that often is life, trying to survive, or if they saw it, no one reported it. But the wise men saw it, and they were not even Jews. They were Persians for goodness sake. They lived far, far from Jerusalem. Many scholars think they lived in what was Babylon. They did not share a common religion with the Jews. Later, they are known as, in the Greek, Magi or Magi, same words from which we derive magicians. They practiced astrology, alchemy, and then a number of other different practices that are strange falling on our ears. They were not kings, as the carol says. They were seekers of wisdom, stargazers, heads up, searching the midnight skies. I suppose that much of what they practiced would have been condemned by the religious leaders in Jerusalem, the very same ones that didn't even see the star. Certainly, the practice of magic and astrology has been condemned by Orthodox Christianity. After all, how many witches have we burned in our past? I personally think magic is tomfoolery. That's my personal opinion. And the Greek word for witchcraft and witches comes from the word that we derive pharma, it's called pharmaceuticals, from which we derive pharmaceuticals. In essence, they knew enough, the Greeks did, to know that there was some relationship between what you swallowed or smoked and the magic you could see. It was in their heads through hallucination. And even though I do not believe in magic, I do believe in epiphany. The word from Greek means a showing within. In essence, a revelation to a person or a group of persons. Something that was hidden is now seen. These men, and by the way, we don't actually know how many there were. I know that'll blow up your whole holiday season. You always said, it's always been said there's three. No, there are three gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We don't know how many wise men came. But the important thing is they had a collective epiphany. Something somewhere in the world was happening, and they didn't want to miss out on it. Some great leader had been born, and with this leader would come the winds of change. God even spoke 
to these wise men in a dream and told them not to go back and report to Herod, but go home by another way. Sneak out of Bethlehem. God spoke to these strangers. And I think these wise men remind us of the ingredients that make for an epiphany, an inward showing forth, an inward revelation. And the star, whatever, however you want to describe it. Most people missed it. Herod was too busy being what Herod was, a powerful person, and in increasing his influence in Rome. Regular folks were just trying to survive. And the scribes and, and the chief priests were too caught up in maintaining the temple and searching the scriptures. The wise men teach us what we need to remember. Look at the stars. Gaze upon this created world. Ponder how magnificent this gift of this world is really is and see the greatness and the power and the beauty of the God who speaks it into being behold the stars in the Celtic Christian tradition there are two books Both of equal importance. There is the big book and the little book. And they are both needed for an epiphany, for a revelation. The big book in the Celtic Christian tradition is creation is all the beauty of what God has created. I prefer the portion in the big book called Mountains. Some of you prefer the portion in the book called The Ocean. Since I was in the Navy, I never want to go to the ocean again. So it doesn't apply to me, your portion of the book. But I do understand the power that is manifest in the waves and the tides. Look at the color of birds. Magnificent. Or butterflies or whatever God has created. However you want to define that creation. Behold, but look at the stars. The psalmist of the eighth psalm writes this. O oh Lord our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And when I look at the heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have established. And then this psalmist goes on to say, You are so mighty. What do we, these little specks on the planet Earth, what do we matter? That's the big book. Abraham, I've often thought about this. And I thought about it on the way home from Dallas. Abraham... 
was a wandering herdsman and he was out there and he could see without neon lights of Las Vegas, without the lights of San Antonio, he could see the stars and all of their twinkling perfection. And I think it opened his mind to receive the word of the Lord. But in my drive home, I had decided that Going through Austin and being in a traffic jam for an hour and a half, if Abraham had done that, he would not have followed God anywhere. <laughs> These wise men, wandering wanderers, as was Abraham. But the big book is not enough. The psalmist asks, what is the human being that you're even mindful of us? Or the sons and daughters of human beings that you even care? It's the little book that gives us that answer. It's little because it's so small compared to the universe, but is equally as important. In the little book, we listen for God speaking to us through those who have gone before us. The women and the men that have marched through time in relationship with this God. And Faith in God. In the little book, we learn the ways that God speaks. Speaks to the human heart. We also learn that God works in human history. In the little book, we learn... And John, that the word that spoke the universe into being became flesh. We couldn't go to God, so God came to us in a form we could understand. We know that in the little book. In the little book, we learn that God is also personal and intimate, as well as infinite, omniscient, omnipotent. We listen, if, but by the same token, if we listen only to the little book, we miss all the vastness and the greatness, the magnificence, the power of God working in creation. But if we listen only to the big book, we miss the voice speaking to us in those special places in our hearts. The wise men Remind us that we need to listen in stereo. Big book, little book. The wise men remind us that this world was for us to experience the beauty and the bounty creation. The wise men also remind us that God is vast as God is, infinite as God is, God is also personally ready to speak. To you and to me. Look around then. Hold that 
in stereo. Sit out. Watch the birds. Hear the wind in the trees. Oh, and don't forget the stars outside of the city limits. But at the same time, pick up the little book. And learn that that God loves you. The wise men find the baby Jesus and they kneel before this child. They had followed a star in the heavens. And they had found the very one that the little book prophesied about. May it be also for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.